Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello, everybody. This is Brett Norman. Today is a beautiful Saturday day on January 12th, 2019. And I have a very special broadcast today on a very special book that I found. Well, actually, I was looking for Henry Grant and Guinness's book with the same title. And somehow I found this on eBay and I was very intrigued by it. And I thought, well, it's an awful lot of money for a small book, but why not? So I ordered it up and I got it and I just, my jaw hit the floor when I first opened it up and I thought, okay, I got to get this, I got to get this done. I got to get this PDF made, put it out there and, and give this to Yerk and give this to everybody so they can read it. So I have with me Yerk Lisman and also I have... Daryl Eberhardt, and we're going to do a reading with Yerk Glissman on this book, and he is so kind to do a reading for us, and we're going to be commenting and discussing the different points in this wonderful tiny little book. It's about four inches by six inches, and this week, thankfully, I had enough time to uh, get some uh, get some PDF work done, and I got that done and put it up on the internet for everybody. So uh, I'm just waiting and excited to introduce both Daryl and Yerk. So I'll introduce Yerk first. Welcome, Yerk. 
Hello, uh, Brett, and thank you very much for the introduction. I was waiting for you to finally announcing the title of the book, so I put it. <laughs> <laughs> I put it here in yes. the picture, and I think this is something that a lot of people are yearning for uh, information Please, to get out uh, of because it is yeah. called the Divine Program of the World's History. The problem is that we are all indoctrinated all over the world with the program of Satan of world's history. And we only are taught Satan's history of the world in our schools and in our colleges and in our high schools and in our universities. And most of the time, even in our libraries, we don't even get the right information anymore. And when I was doing a little search on the internet, because I wanted to know a little bit background on Albert Close, or at least know when he published this book, because I don't have any information on that. I think the book was published somewhere in the 1916, uh, 17, 18, 19, somewhere around that time, if I'm not mistaken. And I haven't, find, I haven't found any information on Albert Close whatsoever, so when you, uh, whenever you can fill in something there would be interesting. And then I, I was just looking for the pictures, and then I just uh, took this picture of the cover of the book that we have, this at least, And you know the title alone already, The Divine Program of the World's History. It would be wonderful um, to study in this some 200-page thick book of Albert Close to get a better understanding of what God has planned for this world and what, what God's real history of this world is and to compare it, not, not even to compare it, but by that showing the lie that has been taught to all of us all through our lives. And I'm speaking about us who are here at this moment. I'm speaking about the preceding uh, generation and, of course, the, 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 the coming generation. But most of all, our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, our grand-grandparents, who all have been betrayed. Because, let's face it, we are dealing with Satan's program of world history that is formed by the Jesuit order. And when you want to wanna hear someone who really goes into the Jesuit order and who knows more about it than probably I have forgotten in all of my life, I have to turn it over to Daryl. Hello, Daryl. Hey, it's great to be on with both of you. And um, we have a snowy morning here in southwest central Pennsylvania. I was out shoveling a couple inches of snow yesterday, and I have something that I can praise the Lord about, and that is my driveway was very slippery and my stroke leg was sliding, slipping and sliding, and, and yet I, God kept me from falling. So there's, there's a, a miracle. Uh, the Bible tells us, I think it's Psalm 77, 14, that thou art the God that doest wonders, thou hast declared thy strength among the people, if my memory serving me correctly. But I'm so glad that we're going to be Uh, Yerk's going to be uh, reading and uh, Brett taking care of uh, moderating uh, this uh, because I have a book right in my hands right now and I just want to just quickly mention it because it's by the same individual and it's called Jesuit Plots from Elizabethan to Modern Times and it's a tremendous little book and uh, I'm so grateful um, to our Heavenly Father that uh, people like Albert Close and uh, uh, J.A. Kensent and others, David Yollop, I'm just looking right now at his book that he put out in God's name about the murder of uh, Alberto Luciani, uh, Pope uh, John Paul I, and he was murdered. Um, I'm just thankful to God that there are people that are out there that are writing good books about truthful history that the Jesuits have largely tried to erase but not and not but not with some degree success but not total success because people like uh Kensett and Close and that have gotten out the truth and it's still available to us sometimes only in a PDF format so again a big thank you to uh Brett and Yerk uh, for the materials that they forwarded to me that now that I'm semi computer Uh, literate and can uh, now get up and at least use my uh, word processing and use the internet. So um, turn it back over to you guys and, and thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome, Daryl. Thank you both for, for being with me and very much looking forward to digging into this book and getting into the nitty gritty. And, uh, you know, 
I think, Yerk, you, along with me, in our little researches that we've done on Albert Close, it is so difficult to find any information on anything about him. Yeah, I didn't find anything about him. Not on Nothing. Wikipedia, not on any other site. Uh, it is even very hard to find his his books. And even when you are just putting in the title of this book together with his name in Google Images, uh, there are only two or three pictures coming up of that. And most of all, you are getting Henry Gretton Guinness's book of the same title. Yeah. But the most interesting start is, and let me just uh, let me just go from here. Let me go into the reading. This is the PDF, and I'm going to show it full screen. Um, Brother Brett will later on uh, work on this video to make it a little bit more attractive that you see just more than the reading. But because he scanned it this way, and you see there's one page on the right, one page on the left, I have to use about 200% um, to, to put it in letters that is easily to read for me. Um, what we will understand in this book is, is already in the very first sentences. This is so important. This is, this is a wonderful reason why I really just flew on that book and I really wanted to read it. This one that we are reading right here is printed in 1914. Yeah, That is stated on page 185. The Divine Program of the World's History by Albert Close. He is the author of Babylon, the Scarlet Woman, The Hand of God and Satan in Modern History, and The Defeat of the Spanish Armada, and of course of the wonderful book that Daryl just mentioned about the Elizabethan reign, and uh, speaking of the time when Protestantism reigned almost supreme in the United Kingdom, in England, in the time in the 16th century. Because uh, the Elizabethan times was the most Protestant time England all, uh, had in all its history. And of course the succession of uh, King James, but that's about it. After that it always fell again into apostasy. And we are going to learn about this when we are reading the Divine Program of the World's History. But listen, already this very first sentence is so wonderful and a wonderful explanation for our motivation to read this book. It says, the expositions of Daniel and Revelation in this book are for the most part blendings of the interpretations of the five great historical expositors of the 19th century, being Eliot, Barnes, Burks, Bishop Woodsworth, and the Reverend Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness who wrote a book of the same title in 1888 and who wrote the most sublime book next to the Bible that every Christian should know, Romanism and the Reformation from the standpoint of prophecy, that I am so blessed to can read now to my German brethren. I have the English reading of that book from Henry Gretton Guinness on my channels, read by Tom Fress who read that in 34 parts, and now I am so blessed to read that every Sunday night with about 20 people listening to me in live audience in Skype in German, and we are so blessed and we are so enjoying that reading. And so this book that we are going to read here by Albert Close is nothing else but a blending of the interpretations of these five great historical expositors. And that is why this book is so interesting, because it is not the words of Albert Close alone that we are studying, but it is what he put together of all these wonderful Protestant writers from the 19th century that we are going to read the essence of. And that's what makes this book so interesting. Look what kind of a ridiculous price you only paid. Okay. It starts by staying, saying caution. A book that starts with caution, I like already very, very much. False interpretations of prophecy. Here, the author himself, Albert Close, is laying the ground stone for us to understand the motivation and what he is going to uh, unveil in the study of this book. Because it reads... Jesuit origin of the futurist and preterist interpretations of Daniel and Revelation. Now, when you are a follower of the channel Juggler 66, then you know that there is a playlist that is called Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update. And there we have 14 videos of a book that I read together with Tom Fress 
in which we are speaking extensively on the futurist and preterist interpretation on a book that was written by some people, I don't know, some time ago in the 20th century. Very interesting. But now we are getting the Jesuit origin of futurist uh, preterist interpretation of Daniel and Revelation by the words of Albert Close from the beginning of the 20th century. And the very first pages here, or the very first quotes here, comes from the wonderful book from E.B. Elliot and his work, Horae Apocalyptica. And therefore you have to understand that Horae Apocalyptica doesn't mean hooray, but it means our. Yeah? Apocalyptical hour, where you would translate that title of the book. Elliot um, I don't know, Daryl, you probably are aware how many volumes this book is. Five or six volumes, Horae Apocalyptica? Apocalyptic I'm not sure. I don't have a copy of that. I haven't seen it. Uh, I only oh, know what it's we are. expensive to get that one. And, and, yeah, it's and, and at it's least extensive. four volumes. And, yeah. and it's an mm -hmm. extensive work. Yeah, we are reading here yeah. from volume four. I think it is about six volumes, and each volume be. must be about, about some thousand pages or something. It's really... A wonderful work, and if you want to get a little bit information, a little bit more information on that, I can advise you to go to the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio, because Nicholas Arthur, who is the host of First Amendment Radio, did an abridgment of uh, Hor uh, of Hor Ap Apocalyptica from Elliot, and that is very interesting to follow. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to give you the essence of this monumental work that he put together. But let's go and start reading in the book, except, of course, one of my few um, uh, listeners here, Brett or uh, Daryl, have a comment so far up to this moment. No, I oh, don't geez. have any, but I'm looking right at the book right now, the PDF of it. So I have the, 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 what you have right in front of you, the false interpretations of prophecy. And again, I'm glad that you're good with the Latin. I took two years of Latin, and I don't think I could do as good a job as Jörg is doing on the Latin. <laughs> Me neither, no uh, way. That's just a question of, uh, you know... Uh, trying and uh, speaking and falling up and uh, falling down and getting up again and, and trying uh, i i don't like latin it's a dead language but uh, sometimes you just have to use it and um, well i think the title horai apocalyptica is um, speaking in uh, extensive volumes um, of what we are going to read about here because Eliot was a true protestant writer and his title uh, of course then you see oh i can read through his book in one hour no but you probably should read his book in one hour steps this is also the same that i want to announce right here we are going to read this book and we are Go, trying to limit our readings to times of about one hour, maybe a few minutes more or a few minutes less, but about one hour, because you really need to pay attention and you want you, we want you to understand what we are reading here, and therefore you really have to concentrate. And let's be let's be sure nobody of us has the ability to concentrate on a subject like this for more than one hour at a moment. So, let's start. And thank you, Daryl, for your comment that you just made. Both, Fo uh, yeah. <clears throat> Both Fox and Brightman, the commentator who, li uh, who uh, lived in 1601 AD, state that for some time following the Reformation, the Romish doctors were very shy on the subject of Babylon and Antichrist, as revealed in the books of Daniel and Revelation. At length, as the century was advancing to a close, two stout Spanish Jesuits took up the gauntlet and published their respective but quite counter-opinions uh, counter on the apocalyptic subject. And uh, apocalyptic is the word that is used throughout this word when we speak of the book of Revelation, just that you understand. With the book of Revelation is meant the apocalypse in this book. So I don't always change apocalyptic into revelation, but it is because it is an apocalypse, and this is what the author refers it to. So the one, Ribera, a Jesuit priest of Salamanca, who about 18, 1585 published an apocalyptic commentary, which was on the grand points of Babylon and Antichrist, the futurist scheme. The other, Louis de Alcazar, also a Spanish Jesuit of Seville, the preterist, meaning 
that the apocalyptic prophecies have all been fulfilled in the fall of pagan Rome and in the calamities to the Jews. Either suited the great object of the writers equally well, meaning that of setting aside all application of the prophecies of Antichrist from the existing Church of Rome and of mixing up the whole Protestant ministry. The one by making it overleap almost altogether the immense interval of time which has elapsed since the prophecy was given, and plunge in its pictures of Antichrist into a yet distant future, just before the consummation, meaning the return of Jesus Christ. The other, speaking of Alcazar's preterist, by making it stop entirely short of the papacy at the 5th century. Eliot gives the following brief sketch of the invented interpretations of both Ribera and Alcazar. And it is um, quite interesting that we understand here that, of course, as you already understood from this little reading I did now, we have a futurist scheme from Jesuits and we have a preterist scheme from Jesuits, so that means we have a futurist interpretation and we have a preterist uh, 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 interpretation, and these both uh, are, um, how, how do you say that, they exclude one another. When you believe yeah. the one, the other one is excluded. And when you believe the other, the other one is excluded. Yeah, Daryl, you wanted to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to say they're contradictory views, and, and both views were put forward by the Jesuits to get the spotlight off of papal Rome as being uh, the harlot, uh, the Babylonian harlot, and, and the o onus of uh, Antichrist off of the papacy. So the Jesuits were working overtime, and Tom Fress has brought this out very, very much in his uh, Inquisition update. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, mutually exclusive was the term that I was looking for. I just couldn't come to the term at that moment. But, you know, I'm not a native English speaker, and sometimes I just have the right thoughts, but not the correct words in my head. So <laughs> I, needed, I needed a little <laughs> moment. They Thanks. are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, the preterist teaching that we read here of is excluding the futurist scheme. And the futurist scheme is excluding the preterist scheme. But, but now you have to say, well, these are teachings that come from the Jesuits, right? And the Jesuits are linked in a certain kind of way to the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Catholic Church puts on two teachings on the lay people to put the spotlight away from the papacy as being the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. And these two schemes that they put out are mutually exclusive. Now, let me ask you one question. How trustworthy is the Roman Catholic Church when it puts out two studies that are mutually exclusive. How can you even trust that church one second? Don't you think that whether you have to believe the one or you have to believe the other, that maybe the right way is in the middle? Because you have three ways of explanation altogether. You have the preterist, which is in the past. You have the historicist, which is the biblical. And you have the futurist, which is in the future. Now, when the futurist excludes the preterist, and the preterist excludes the futurist, what are you left with? Historicism. And that's what we are going to read. And this is what Albert, Cl Albert Close makes the point of in this reading and in this few sentences that I just explained to you. Yeah? Ribera, who put out the Jesuit um, explanation of the futurist Antichrist, to take off the spotlight of the papacy that was exposed as being the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist during the beginning of the Reformation, in the beginning of the 16th century, and especially by Martin Luther, and by Calvin, and by Zwingli, and by Tyndale, and before even by Wycliffe, and by Huss, and so on, and so on. Everybody of these reformers all put their fingers on the papacy as being the Biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. They may be differed in opinion on this or that subject, 
but on the subject of the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist, they all agreed unanimously that was the papacy. And this spotlight had to be taken off because the Pope could not reign supreme over the earth if the people knew that he is the Antichrist. So the Jesuits had to come up with stories about, no, the Antichrist is not the papacy. The Antichrist is, whether in the past, preterist or in the future, as Rabira tells. So this is just the ground stone that I am laying, that everybody understands fully what this book is actually all about. It is a, 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 a thorough explanation of the lies, of the false teaching of the Antichrist, satanic, diabolical church and synagogue of Satan, which calls itself the Christian church, the Unam Sanctum, the only holy church and the righteous successor of Jesus Christ on this earth, the Roman Catholic Church. We are going to expose during this book that she is, she was, and she always will be the carrier of the Antichrist on the top of her hierarchy, the papacy. Now, I'm going to continue. Ribera unfolds the apocalypse as if it were nothing else but certain commentaries upon our Lord's prophecy on Matthew chapter 24. Uh, 20, yeah, 24. He makes it begin with the early period of the church. So we go into a little footnote here which says, Some 20th century Protestant scholars, ignorant of the origin, are now teaching this view as if it were a modern discovery. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, and why are they ignorant, these scholars, of its origin? Because they are visiting seminaries that have been infiltrated by Jesuits. And of course, there you will not learn the truth. So his first seals white horse and rider, oh, speaking of the book of Revelation, signify the gospel triumphs of the apo ap uh, apostolic era. His third seal's black horse rider, heresies. His fourth seal, the violence of Trajan's persecution of the church and multitudes of deaths of Christians under it, by sword, famine, wild beasts, etc. At length, in the sixth seal, Ribera explains the phenomena there figured as meant of the signs before Christ's second coming spoken of in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21 and construes the sealing vision too with all that follows in the apocalypse to have reference to the time of a future antichrist. The 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7 he makes to be the Jews converted to Christ at the consummation, meaning the second coming of Christ though inconsistently afterwards explaining the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14 of both Jews and Gentiles under Antichrist and taking the number 144,000 even literally. In Apocalypse or Revelation chapter 10, the descending angel is the same that proclaimed about the book in Revelation chapter 5, and who swears that, because of men's not having been led to repent by the six previous trumpet plagues, the end of the world and last judgment are now at hand. In Apocalypse or Revelation chapter 11, alike the temple and holy city figured the church. And the cities being given to, trot, uh, to be trod by Gentiles meant that it would be obtained and occupied by Antichrist with armies consisting of heathenish men. Ribera's slaughter place for the two witnesses when slain by Antichrist or the beast from the abyss is the city of Jerusalem, their three and a half days of death denoting Antichrist's three and a half years. And speaking of literal years, not of prophetic years. That's very, very important also to understand. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 12, Ribera teaches that the woman is the church travailing in the last times just before the three and a half years of Antichrist, seeing that her three and a half years in the wilderness coincides with those of Antichrist's reign, for he identifies the dragon with the beast Antichrist. Then, as to the beast and his great city Babylon in Apocalypse chapter 13 and chapter 18, here is the main point in Ribera's system. 
he admits that the woman in Apocalypse chapter 17 is Rome, even papal Rome, and argues from chapter 17 verse 16 that shortly before the consummation the ten kings figured in the beast's ten horns shall overthrow Rome, this being probably before the coming of Antichrist. The Apocalypse or Revelation chapter 16, the vile plagues, are expounded literally as those on Egypt. In Apocalypse chapter 18, Rome's burning is explained to be in judgment on the sins both of old pagan Rome and of Rome apostatized. Let the reader carefully compare Ribera's teaching with the futurist teaching of, say, Rev. S. R. Maitland, B. W. Newton, Rev. Michael Baxter, and the Brethren generally, and he or she will have no doubt where futurism came from and of its dreadful travesty of divine truth. Think of teaching that the Reformers were wrong, and the Jesuits were right. Now we go into Alcazar's Preterist interpretation, that was founded in AD 1603. Alcazar's commentary was the prototype or original of the Preterist system of Grotius, and the modern German rationalistic expositors. Alcazar's general argument is that the Apocalypse describes a twofold war of the Church, one with the synagogue or old Jewish religion, the other with paganism, and a twofold victory and triumph over both adversaries. More particularly, the development of the subject was thus. First, from Revelation chapter 1 through 11, the rejection of the Jews and desolation of Jerusalem by the Romans, and second, from Revelation chapter 12 through 20, both inclusive the overthrow of paganism and establishment of the empire of the Roman Church over Rome and the whole world, the judgment of the great whore and destruction of Babylon being effected by Constantine and his successors. And finally, number three, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, under the type of the Lamb's Bride, the New Jerusalem, a description of the glorious and triumphant state of the Roman Church in heaven. Now, we are uh, reading just a few corrections here, and this tablet we also go into the next page, so I'm going to continue on the next page, which is here on page Roman 5, where we are continue. What the Church of Rome claims today about the origin of the Futurist and Preterist interpretations, speaking of the beginning of the 20th century when Albert Close wrote this book. When we remember that the Council of Trent in AD 1551 sent definite instructions to the Jesuits of Paris that there was no better way to demolish the Protestant Church in England of heresy than by mixture of doctrines, we can understand why the Jesuits invented these two systems of prophetic interpretations. Now let me just stop here with the reading for a moment. Um, the author says here, when we remember that the Council of Trent in 181551 sent definite instructions to the Jesuits of Paris, there was a book written, if I'm not mistaken, and Daryl can correct me if I'm mistaken, by, I think it was Nicolini, who wrote a book about a secret meeting of Jesuits that he was listening into and took notes and wrote a book upon it because that was what they wrote down, how they actually conspired to bring down Protestantism in good old England in the time of the Council of Trent. Was it Nicolini, G.B. Nicolini, uh, Daryl? I'm looking on my floor here trying to dig through a bunch of my old books and... Uh... I can't find that one right now. I see Jacobo Leone, and there's so many people that have written good books about Jesuits, but I have the one you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I was sure that you have. I mean, we didn't plan this, but uh, I was quite sure that you have. And uh, I have them also. Uh, let me just see if it was Nicolini, because, you know, um, uh, isn't, it, isn't it this one? Let's just open this book up. The disc is working overtime here. History of the Jesuits, their origin, progress, doctrines, and designs by G.B. Nicolini. Wasn't it this work, this work uh, from 1854? I'm pretty sure you're correct there. I just can't find my copy on the floor. <laughs> uh, I, I just have the PDF here. And I also have another one that is uh, that has another name that is called 
let's just go here. Um, ah, yeah, that's the same. History of the Jesuits, their origin, progress, doctrines, and designs by G. B. Nicolini from 1884. I just happened to have two PDFs of that book. And um, I, I think um, that this is the book where uh, he speaks about that uh, listening to from another room uh, to the Jesuits conspiring against um, against England uh, in that time. So I think that is that. And now the author picks this up when he says, when we remember that the Council of Trent in 1551 sent definite instructions to the Jesuits of Paris. So there were couriers sent from Trent, which is in northern Italy, to France, to Paris, to the capital of France, Paris, to make sure that what was being um, decided at the Council of Trent, behind closed doors, would be made public to the quote-unquote brethren, to the quote-unquote fathers of the Jesuit order, that are infiltrating in England in that time, because we are speaking of the time where Albert Close wrote his other book about, right? The Elizabethan uh, reign that was in 1558 that started. Um, so during the time of Queen Elizabeth, the Jesuits already fomented many, many different uh, assassinations on Queen Elizabeth. Um, and she was helped, of course, by her... Um, uh, what's that called? This this lord, I I always forget his name, the one who is the founder of the uh, of the English. Uh, you talking about uh, Walsington or? Yeah, Wal Walsington. Wal 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 Walsington. Wal what's his name? Wal. I think it's Walsington. I'm not sure. Yeah, Walsington. 100%. Something like that. He he's he's the founder of the English intelligence system. Yes. Uh, under Queen Elizabeth and um, Wals Walsingham. Walsington, I think. But Walsington, Walsingham, whatever. Uh, you can look that up for yourself. You know, we don't have to put all the names into your mouth here. <laughs> Do your own research a little bit. Um, but um, he was he was working overtime to protect Queen Elizabeth in the time from all the different assassinations the Jesuits plotted. And next, from of course the assassinations the Jesuits plotted, plotted it. Plotted? No, plotted. <laughs> uh, from all the assassinations they plotted, they were also, of course, um, uh, doing work on infiltration. And there is something that I just learned during this week, and I think Brett will stand here right now with his jaw falling down on his um, on his desk where he's sitting on when I tell him that. You know what I found out, Brett, in this week? By reading through the lines and uh, understanding a little bit of what I read again in Rulers of Evil and other books, mm -hmm. the Jesuits were just using the gunpowder plot to deviate the people from their infiltrational work. You know how we wondered when we read in Cold World Babylon, why was this uh, Lord Monteagle, was his name I mm -hmm. think, warned by a letter? that he should not be in the opening of parliament because uh, there would be an assassination on that. And with that letter, he went to the king and they found um, um, Guy Fawkes beneath with 36 barrels of gunpowder. Do you have any idea where this letter comes from? Oh, boy. Go ahead. No. I don't know. It is not revealed in any book. It is unknown where that letter comes from. So the Jesuits have a plot to blow up the English parliament for months, if not years, in advance. And just before they go to execute it, an anonymous letter is put in the hands of someone who is being, quote-unquote, warned not to go there. And of course they know that he will be a whistleblower and that they will be discovered. So everybody knew that the Jesuits were busy with trying to blow, to blow up the English parliament and nobody paid attention to them infiltrating the seminaries and the churches. Oh, man. Blown cover as cover as Tapasaw, he calls it in his book, Rulers of Evil. 
The wow. gunpowder plot was just a, how do you say that? D derivation. Diversion. diversion. Thank you, Daryl. Mm. Was just a diversion to put the focus on that kind of action so they didn't see the other action the Jesuits were doing from that moment on. Wow. That's something that I learned during last week. And <laughs> that's just a wonderful revelation. At, hmm. least, at least in my conception. Hmm. I think it shows yeah. that a lot of the things that they do is just like with the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 is it, the action will sometimes give them two or three different results. Either one is favorable to the Jesuits. So they had hoped to split the United States into two warring countries that would be at each other's throats for probably a, a century. But that didn't work out, so they used it as a major bloodbath to cleanse the Protestant South of the United States of America and to in institute a very, very strong centralized government, just as they want to have, have for centuries wanted to have a very centralized papacy where the Pope was really running everything and not the Roman Curia. And they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. But they often have two or three different outcomes that can come about, all of which will be favorable to the Jesuits, no matter which way it turns out. The same way they, when they foment, foment revolutions and wars, uh, they often will back, and this is their modus operandi, they will, standard operating procedures, they will often back both sides the communist left or whatever, and a right-wing dictatorship. And uh, either way, the victory is the Jesuits. And they cleanse the country or region or area of all of the enemies of what the perceived enemies of the Jesuits and the, the papal uh, power. Yeah, thank you, Daryl, for what you are saying. You are just explaining the Hegelian dialectic. Yes. And... The most important part of the Hegelian dialectic when you speak or when you connect the Hegelian dialectic with the Jesuits, the most important thing that you have to understand, and let me just change the picture. People have probably read the text right now. I'm going to give you this picture. What's the most important part to understand from the Hegelian dialectic with the, in conference with the Jesuits? We are speaking of thesis, thesis on one side and, uh, and, and, and synthesis, uh, antithesis on the other side. And that leads to a synthesis. Now, the Jesuits control the thesis, but they also control the antithesis. And, of course, they have already planned the synthesis. And that's what Daryl, just another word, said. Either outcome, whatever the outcome is, it will always be an advantage of the Jesuits' plans. Or, in the words as Tom Fress puts it, the grandfather Clark will take Tuck, tick, tuck, left, right, left, right. And the only thing that will change is the hand on the top of the clock that is not seen by the people who are working just the pendulum. That's 100% correct. This is going to be an interesting study, this book, eh? <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it. Now, let me continue uh, on this page, Roman 5. In November 1911, the Roman Catholic, quote-unquote, Truth Society, because, you know, um, Roman Catholic and Truth are also mutual exclusive words, <laughs> published a little pamphlet entitled The Beasts and the Little Horn by Reverend G.S. Hitchcock, Doctor of Sacred Scripture in Rome. On page 7, he says, quote, and this is underlined in green because this is a very, very important sentence. Dr. G.S. Hitchcock says, quote, The Preterist School, founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. What? 
He explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. So that means he is not even sure whether there is a 340 year gap between when that happens. What the freak are you telling me here? The Preterist school founded is not even sure of the end time. Whether it's 70 AD, that's possible, but it's also possible that it was 401 AD. There is only a minor 340 years in between. And now do you get it that not only the futurist and preterist teaching are mutually exclusive, but even in the preterist school, in the preterist teaching, they don't even have no idea when it was all fulfilled. Could be 70 AD, but could also be 410 AD. And let me tell you, I even heard of a third date. It could also have been 476 AD, which is the eventual splitting of the pagan Roman Empire into ten kingdoms. Right? Now, the next hmm. sentence is also very important. Brett, do you have a comment here? Nope. Go okay. ahead. The next Wonderful. sentence is also very important. The futurist school, the same doctor says, the futurist school founded by Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. Now, why is this so important? A rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, my dear brethren. There is a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem only in the futurist school. And this is what a, what a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, G.S. Hitchcock himself says. There is a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation only in the futurist school. That means, and that's the point that you have to understand, this brings down all the teaching of Tom Fress, of me and Brett and Daryl in all these years. When you have the historicist view on the Bible and on the history of the world, then there cannot be a legitimate temple in Jerusalem in the New Testament times. Then there cannot be a new quote-unquote found state of Israel as we have today over there in the Near East. That is only possible from the futurist point of view. And here we have a Roman Catholic doctor who states that by himself, right of the horse's mouth, you see that the temple that they are going to build is only a result of futurist revelation interpretation and not of the biblical view. So when Tom Fress and me and others say that state of Israel is of no importance, it's just a big concentration camp to fit the agenda of the Antichrist for the annihilation of the Jewish race once and forever, you have here from the words of a Roman Catholic doctor the absolute confirmation. Let me read it again. Let it sink in. The futurist school founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591 looks for Antichrist, Babylon and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. Any comment from you guys? Bam. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too when I read that verse. <laughs> yeah. Nailed it. Now, Elliot and Dr. Hitchcock both agree that preterism and futurism were invented by the Jesuits, but there's a difference of a few years in the dates assigned. The following lists demonstrate how the Christian ministry has been mixed up by Jesuit interpretations. So we read here, that people like Ribera, Maitland, Newman, which is Cardinal Newman, by the way, a convert from Protestantism into Roman Catholicism in the 19th century, one of the most satanic people in, uh, in, in good old England all through history, in my, uh, in my perception, Todd, Burke, Tregellis, Plymouth Brethren, Newton and Mr. Baxter, all held to the futurist interpretation that was published in 1591. The Preterist interpretation that was published by Louis de Alcazar in 1614, founded a little bit earlier, as you can see here, 1603, but it was published in 1614, have people like Alcazar, Boswit, Eichhorn, 
Berthold, Kühnen, Hitzig, Hilgenfeld, Delitzsch, Cornell, Beven, Driver, Anderson Scott, Sweet and Moffat. Now interesting is that the first name, of course, is a Spanish guy. The second name is a French guy. But the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth name are all German. Eichhorn, Berthold, Kühnen, Hitzig, Heiligenfeld, or Hilgenfeld and Delitzsch. All German names. And boy, are we going into the German deception a few pages on from here. Mm. I am so glad that I don't call myself a German anymore, but that I call myself a brethren of the kingdom of God. I don't belong to any nation in this world anymore. But the Germans had a very, very profound role in spreading the futurist and the preterist doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we read who was important for the futurist idea and who was important for the preterist interpretation. Now we're going to read who are the ones that are important for the historical interpretation. The Waldenses, speaking of a whole people, Pierre d'Olive, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Tyndale, John Knox, Brightman, John Fox, you know, Acts and Monuments author, Fleming, Edwards, Keith, E.B. Elliot, Barnes, Burks, Wordsworth, Gordon, and last but not least, Henry Gretton Guinness. The Spirit of God never inspired three different interpretations. Futurist and preterist works, unless continually advertised, die with their authors. Second-hand booksellers cannot supply the demand today for Elliot's and Guinness's works. I highlighted that in green, because that was about a hundred years ago. Today, nobody cares for these writings anymore. But a hundred years ago, you could not get the books because they were so high in demand. Today, you cannot get them anymore because nobody cares for that anymore. Nobody cares for the historical interpretation. And I have another little comment to make here, but I will save that for another time. And let's go into the next page. But here we go into the preface. So how far are we into the video today? Let's just see. Oh, 48 minutes. So we're going to continue a little bit. We go into the preface of the book. Uh, this book is not a book of one man's ideas. It is a compendium of the teaching and interpretations of the prophetic scriptures by some of the greatest, most learned and spiritually minded men the Christian Church has ever produced. These men, besides being great scholars, were men who knew the Holy Spirit as a living teacher. Their writings breathe with the Holy Spirit in every page. They instinctively recognized the character and origin of the great futurist and preterist movements to change the interpretation of prophecy in the early 19th century and uncompromisingly repudiated these two Jesuit systems. Uncompromisingly, no compromise possible with the true inerrant word of God. They thought that a terrible time of trouble was to come on the world before the second advent of Jesus Christ. Not as so-called celestial vengeance, but as a direct result of the law of sowing and reaping. As a direct consequence of, what, uh, of men attempting to run the world scientifically without God and without recognizing the, self, the selfishness of of the heart of man. Now, why did I put this in a very springing yellow color? To run the world scientifically without God and the selfishness of the heart of man? Think of today's agenda of transhumanism. That is to run the world scientifically without God. Science rules the world. Not God rules the world, but Gnostic science. By the selfishness of the heart of men. What are they doing, trying to do with uh, transhumanism? 
combine man and machine, making themselves God, run the world scientifically without God. But we are going to be gods ourselves. Isn't that a fulfilling of what the serpent told Eve in the Garden of Eden? Yea, you will sure, yea, as God said, that you will die. Uh, you will surely not die, but you will become. You will know good and evil, and you will, um, and you will become as gods. The promise of the serpent, and this is exactly what this little sentence tells us. Man is running to uh, is trying to run the world scientifically without God, and without recognizing the selfishness of the heart of man. God says on the heart of men that the heart of men is evil con uh, continually, right? In Genesis chapter 6. Now, since the beginning of the 20th century, their writings have been considered as out of date by modern theological scholars. Men would hear nothing about such gloomy subjects, so that Christian church as a whole adopted the modern and popular doctrine of the upward progress of the race. And here you already see the roots of this racism from Adolf Hitler in the Second World War and the supreme races and all that baloney. Then came the Great War of 1914 with its horrible crimes by a so-called cultured race. And then these same men cried out about the failure of Christianity. Yeah. Christianity has failed because the Roman Catholic Church puts itself out as Christianity and kept itself in the background while pulling the strings of that world war. But has Christianity failed? No, it has not. The modern false conception, however, has failed. In the following pages, the author has endeavored to set forth the true teaching of the scriptures concerning the future of our world as interpreted by these great men who have left their footprints in the sands of time. Their teaching agrees with that of God's long line of great Christian leaders extending back to the days of Christ and the Apostles. The Holy Spirit certainly never sent the great leaders in the Reformation age to proclaim one interpretation of prophecy, and then in the 19th and 20th century, another school of teachers to teach the modern interpretation with all its fallacies about the upward progress of the race. Speaking of evolution, it is this modern teaching that has failed and not Christianity. And now comes a sentence that destroys me in my German mind. This teaching came from Germany. It's part of the German evolutionary doctrine. Yeah, and I was born a German. I can't help it, you know. Um, by the way, I just read a little bit over this one footnote here um, at the end of the sentence, to run the world scientifically without God and without recognizing selfish of the heart of men. We read in this little footnote, very important, before newspaper editors and writers talk so glibly about celestial vengeance, they should carefully read what the Bible teaches concerning the terrible law, the law of sowing and reaping. What does the Bible teach on the law of sowing and reaping? You will so, uh, you will reap what you saw, right? So yeah, when you that's it. when you when you saw violence, you will reap violence. When you saw bloodshed, you will reap bloodshed. That's the point. And when that you is, should, when you sow deception, you reap deception. Yeah, it is not that God all of a sudden turns against mankind because God loves men. But it is that God leaves men doing as he wants because you know God says, well, we, when you don't want to listen to me, then listen to yourself and see where it leads you. And look at the world today in 2019 and you see where it has led the world when men listens to men, right? Yeah. We can right. only be very grateful to our Lord that he still has the Holy Spirit in this world because if he would ever um, take the Holy Spirit out of this world, all hell would break loose. Absolutely. But that's why Jesus Christ said, Christ said that we should not despair. He will be with us always, even until the end, and that is by or through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not be taken out of this world. Whatever the futurist interpretation of uh, Bible prophecy will tell you, because they say that in um, 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, he who now let us is the Holy Spirit. That is what being taught in the churches all today. So they will teach you that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes away and then the Antichrist is being revealed and then all hell breaks loose. And I'm going to tell you... Comment. Yeah, mm, please. Please, go ahead. Please, please. And I, and I will tell you that um, all hell will break loose anyway, but the Holy Spirit will always be here and he will protect his people. He will not protect every man. He will not protect the men who are playing along with that role of Antichrist. They are not... Uh, he is not going to protect all the people who are uh, willingly fulfilling the agenda of the devil, but he will protect the Christian people. That's why there are so many places in the Bible where it says that even when famine and diseases and everything that comes, uh, don't you worry. It will not be um, uh, put onto you. We have our peace made with our Lord Jesus Christ, very, very importantly. So this is why I just wanted to go back into this little footnote that we are reading here. So the law of sowing and reaping, know what you saw. When you know what you saw, then you also know what you reap. But please, Brett, you wanted to make a comment there. Yeah, I wanted to comment on that sentence. It is part of the uh, <clears throat> the German... Uh, ah, Let me get the book in front of me. I was staring at the screen here. Um, it's part of the German... Uh, uh, evolutionary doctrine. Evolutionary doctrine. I'm on the other page here. Um, I haven't turned the page because I've been staring at the screen. And uh, I, I just wanted to say, Yerk, you know, um, you're not the only one that feels crushed. Because when you take into consideration all the Germanic peoples on this earth, it goes far beyond the Germans. It goes into every nation. We're all German. As far as that's concerned, yeah, that, and we don't even know it. We think the, we're Nordics or whatever, but we're all Germans. That's that's true for for a big point. You know, I think the most important point that you have to understand is that Germany is more or less in the heart of the fourth beast in the system in the in the in the fourth beast system, right? That last mm -hmm. beast that Daniel spoke of in uh, chapter 7, yeah, he speaks mm -hmm. of four beasts that we are going to discover a little bit later in the reading of this book, of course, because we are dissecting Daniel, uh, as it was already announced in the beginning of this book. This fourth beast that comes after Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece, Rome, this fourth beast has a heart. And that heart is, in my understanding, probably Germany and the surrounding area. About that. But even though that that is the pounding heart of that fourth terrible beast that treads everything with its iron feet on this earth into oblivion, also from that heart came the Reformation in the form of Martin Luther. And to my understanding, that is also very important. So the heart is, you know, working two ways, working evil on the one hand, because listening to Satan, the big dragon, and on the other hand, listening to the Holy Spirit, because there's no doubt in my mind that Martin Luther was imputed with the Holy Spirit when he came out of the Roman Catholic Church, when he stood upright and warms and did not retract anything of what he said or what he wrote, and when he then went to the Wartburg and translated the Bible within a few weeks, into German and gave more than a hundred million people in Europe at that time the word in their, the, the true word of God in their own language. I mean, he was surely led by the Holy Spirit. So every dark side has also a bright aspect in that regard. But it is a very important sentence that we are reading here where it says, it is this modern teaching that has failed and not Christianity. This teaching came from Germany. It is part of the German evolutionary doctrine. You have to understand, therefore, what happened in the, 18, uh, in the 19th century with Germany. We have this, quote-unquote, higher criticism. We have these German philosophers and psychologists like Immanuel Kant and um, uh, Schopenhauer and Freud and all these people, you know, 
and they were doing everything but listening to the Bible. They were treading on the Bible. They were stepping on God's word. And that is the teaching that came out of Germany and that influenced many people all over the world. That influenced people in the United States of America, that influenced people in the, in the United Kingdom, in, the, in England, that influenced people all over the world. That teaching that originated from Germany, that was in the 19th century. But also that came teaching from Germany in the 16th century, and that was the thinking of the Protestant thought that was of the revolutionary reformational thought and that also um, had its influence all over the world. It is part of the German evolutionary doctrine, this devilish working in the 19th century, but there was also a part of the German reformational doctrine that came out a few centuries before. We should never forget that. So when everybody, anybody says here, oh damn the Germans for this and for that, then also think of what they have done in a better way. But the Germans are, for a very big part, of course, depending on Roman Catholicism. And they are pounding, they are the pounding heart of the Holy Roman Empire. That's why in the beginning of the 16th century, its name was changed from the Holy Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. Most of the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire came out of Germany. And that is by design. Okay? So, I think we are wow. about in an hour right now, right? Yeah, so, maybe we should close it up. Uh, yeah. We haven't heard from Daryl for a little bit here. Daryl, do you have any commentary? Yeah, a kind of. Uh, I'll just give a, a short quotation here because it kind of sums up what we've been talking about. It was it's by a quotation from a man named Joseph Tanner. He was a clergyman. He wrote a book called Daniel and Revelation, and here's what he says: Accordingly, towards the close of the century of the Reformation. Two of Rome's most learned, and he means Jesuit doctors, Jesuit doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit El Khasar devoted himself to bring into prominence the preterist method of interpretation to show the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome and therefore could not, allegedly, apply to the papacy. On the other hand, the Jesuit Francisco Ribera tried to set aside the application of the prophecies to papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. So uh, what we're covering is a very important topic. Uh, it was uh, uh, really uh, made famous in the United States by a guy named C.I. Schofield and his Schofield Study Bible amongst uh, so-called uh, Christian fundamental circles. And that's when uh, the historicist position was set aside in the United States of America back in the uh, 1800s, middle to late 1800s, and you find this futurist system taking off and then running amok with people like Hal Lindsey, etc. But a lot of this got started with the C.I. Schofield uh, study Bible for the King James Bible, uh, but it was a study Bible with all kinds of notes that promoted futurism. So what we're covering is an extremely important topic, and we need to remember, again, this is whether it's preterism, whether it's futurism, it's designed to get the spotlight off of the papacy as being the historic Antichrist, something that all of the top reformers from Luther to Calvin to Zwingli they all they didn't agree on everything, but one thing they did all agree on, and that was that the office of the papacy was the Antichrist. And so this is uh, a very, very important subject. So I thank you, gentlemen, for including me in this discussion. Oh, well, you're welcome, Daryl. We're pleased to have you, and we would hope that in the future we can invite you back. And, uh, Yerk, uh, any closing comments here? 
Well, even though that I read the, the book a little bit in advance, as you can saw, because I made some notes here and there, or underlined some sentences here and there. Mm -hmm. um, like always, when you read that for the second time, and probably when I read that for the third time, new thoughts come into mind, and um, I never thought that I would do so extensively about this first few pages, and I'm very glad that we are gathered here together in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, enabling enabled by the Holy Spirit to do his work because this reading that I am doing um, with your support by uh, providing the book and uh, providing the platform for this and Daryl as a wonderful commentator on this I am so glad that we are gathered here together in the name of Jesus Christ as he said in his book wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name in their midst I will be and he sent the comforter to help us into all truths and that we can explain this book from now on for the next readings to our um, to our public that will listen to these videos that will maybe even watch these videos um, and that probably will learn from these videos and I want to end with that, first and for all, we should always learn from the King James Bible, the only inerrant word of God preserved in 2019 in this world in the English language. Read your Bible. Maranatha. Amen, Brother Yerk, and thank you so much, Daryl, for joining us today, and we'll catch you next time. That's all we got for now. Bye-bye. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil, one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.